yeah, I still find myself quite surprised <laughs> to, to be where I am. And uh, it all happened because I walked into the wrong meeting one day and got sucked into the project to design Marsh McLennan's technology strategy and then sucked into trying to deliver it, which anyone who's been a consultant should know you should never do. Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Paul Beswick. Paul is the Chief Information Officer of Marsh McLennan, a leading professional services firm focused on risk, strategy, and people that earns in excess of $20 billion in annual revenue. Paul's been enrolled for nearly three years, and he's modernized and harmonized much of the tech landscape within the company while focusing on adding new innovative disciplines, including investments in our, into artificial intelligence. Prior to his current role, Paul was a partner and global head of Oliver Wyman Labs and global co-head of Oliver Wyman's digital practice. Oliver Wyman is an operating company within Marsh McLennan. Paul, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. Well, I've been looking forward to uh, this conversation. Thank you so much. Maybe we begin, Paul, with a background into Marsh McLennan itself. I mentioned uh, very briefly what the company does, but if you wouldn't mind providing a bit more detail to set context, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, it's an organization that's slightly difficult to describe, but broadly, a uh, professional services firm with four major units, Marsh, the world's largest insurance broker, Mercer, uh, leader in human resources, benefits and investment consulting. Oliver Wyman, which, as you mentioned, is a firm that I joined out of university a long time ago, strategy consulting firm, and Guy Carpenter, uh, which is in the fascinating, uh, but probably slightly esoteric business of reinsurance broking. Interesting, uh, diverse array of businesses, as you say. Um, talk a bit about your purview as Chief Information Officer, uh, if you would. So I lead the uh, technical teams across the entire enterprise and all of those businesses. That's actually a fairly new development in terms of how we've been organized. Um, when I came in and took on this role about three years ago, um, we were really starting the process of bringing uh, what had been business unit-specific technology organizations together into one overall organization. Prior to that, we'd had different teams by business, but with a shared infrastructure and security organization in the middle. So it's been an interesting journey uh, trying to forge one team out of what were quite independent teams before. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to understand a little bit more of that journey. You mentioned the Opco's big consequential businesses, each of them, some slight variations uh, in terms of what they do, some, some more, more significant than others. Talk a bit about that transition from uh, what might be referred to, I suppose, as a decentralized or or more federated model to one at least that has more influence from the center and, and with a cognizance of where possible greater levels of commonality. Can you talk about some of the, the changes that, that have enabled that um, and, and ensured that it's been done in a way that's been respectful of the differences of the, 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 the opcos as well? Yeah, I mean, as you can tell from the description of the different companies, they do fairly different things. Uh, the need to make sure that we're bringing the right expertise to support each of those businesses has been very much forefront in my mind. You're always dealing with a trade-off between relevance and scale efficiency um, when you think about an organizational model like this. And there are parts of what we do where the relevance takes priority and there are parts where the scale efficiency uh, trade-offs are relatively stronger. So we ended up designing a hybrid model. We still have CIOs for each of the businesses. I think that's an important part of making sure that the strategy and the application of technology to that strategy starts with the business and that we don't end up um, dictating the strategy of our business units from the center. I think that's a terrible place to end up being. But to then really create the capabilities centrally to make sure we're taking advantage of all of the scale that Marsh McLennan has and to be able to use that to bring an increase in cost efficiency for sure, but also, and probably more importantly to me, speed, efficiency, simplification, and all those things that help us move faster and help our businesses compete more effectively. This notion of IT velocity, uh, a term of yours, similar to what you've just said, but put a different way, uh, as you have put it elsewhere. Talk a bit about um, some of the factors that go into increasing that velocity, since that is one of the key uh, metrics, it sounds like, in determining whether or not the organization is successful or not. Yeah, I mean, I fundamentally see that as my primary job, uh, is to drive that velocity up. And we do a lot of work on 
trying to understand what slows us down, how we get tangled up in our own processes, where there's bureaucracy that's unnecessary, where we fail to engineer solutions to problems that we can engineer solutions to that can just help things move um, significantly more quickly. And a huge chunk of where I spend my own time, beyond obviously my responsibilities to keep the firm safe, make sure we deliver projects, etc., across the organization as a whole, is really focused on trying to change the efficient frontier between speed, agility on the one hand and security, compliance, robustness, resilience, et cetera, on the other. Um, so we've done a lot of work on things like building out a platform strategy, building out template projects, having pre-agreed patterns that we can deploy very quickly, taking a lot of the sort of policy and compliance and non-functional aspects of every project that we do and really streamlining those and helping provide people a sort of a roadmap through that stuff one of the things I guess I've learned as I've come into this job is just how important understanding some of the organizational dynamics are and the points of inefficient but stable equilibrium that exist in organization structure that tend to lock you into patterns that are relatively inefficient and thinking very deliberately about how you break through some of those things. Very interesting. I, I've been fascinated through through past conversations of ours as to how much thought you've put into this and the work that you and the team have put uh, into ensuring the organization can, in fact, deliver that. Paul, it's interesting as you continue to, as, as you've spoken about some of the changes afoot that you've ushered in, um, it makes me think a little bit about the cultural implications of what you have put in place. And obviously yours is fundamentally a people-centric business. Talk about the ways, the methods you've used uh, to ensure the culture comes along and perhaps has been pushed in new directions as a result of some of the changes you've described. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey for me, having never managed a team of this size before. How to actually influence and shape the culture of that team was something I had to figure out. Because we brought together a number of different teams, they all had their own unique cultures. I read somewhere an old HBR article, and I'm afraid I can't remember the author, that support functions tend to fall into one of two default cultures. The imperial culture that tries to say, you know, this is the way, this is my way, everyone will follow it. Uh, or the servile culture, which is um, essentially waiting to be asked what to do, and then we'll run off to try and execute it. We had parts of our organization that had each of those two. And when they met, it was a little bit um, ineffective and, and confrontational. So we needed to set a new culture for a new team. We needed to pay respect to the cultures of the teams that existed before. And uh, we needed to forge something that was going to be common and would be a basis on which we could get a very different level of collaboration. So we actually ran a process of gathering ideas from everyone across the team to do that, use that to set some pillars of the overall MMC tech culture, and then drove a lot of work behind that to sort of level up to a new culture that was uh, more collaborative, more ambitious, um, and so on. I did a few things, though, on the communication side to really help reinforce that. One of the interesting things about technology organizations is they don't talk in a, in a sort of widespread way very much. And so I had a little bit of a strategy early on of dominate the airwaves, talk more from my position and centrally about what we were doing than anyone else was, so that those messages were the ones that dominated. We stumbled across an idea, um, Scott Gilbert and, and I, about um, when the pandemic hit, of having a weekly hangout. And every Friday morning at 8.30, we would have just an open Zoom invite. Anyone in the team was welcome to join. And the two of us and someone, and now just me and someone, would have a chat for half an hour about life, their career, uh, what they're doing at the weekend, things that excite them, You know, whether they're going to watch Barbie or Oppenheimer, whatever it might be, uh, with no preparation. So very casual and low key. And we've consistently for three years had about 400 people turn up to that every single week. And that's a great way of both showcasing the wide range of people and backgrounds and interests that we have across a big organization and a way to get some of those messages in um, to the most engaged and probably most influential parts of the organization. Um, so things like that have really helped as well. I think we've very much forged a culture now that does feel like we look to the rest of the organization for solutions, whereas before it was very tower or business unit focused in terms of where people would talk to. The, the other part of it, I think, is I reached down quite deep into the organization um, myself. So I will have a number of side projects going on at any point in time, which could be with, frankly, anyone in the organization. And so 
breaking through what in some places have been a very rigidly hierarchical organization, breaking through all those hierarchical layers to different parts of it has been helpful in then helping create cross connections that don't go up and over um, in the organization structure as much as they used to. I wanted to also talk a bit about how you think about innovation. Um, another another key element uh, to what you and the team do is, is deliver the art of the possible, so to say. And I'd love to get into some examples in a moment. But more generally speaking, uh, how you think about organizing the team or portions of the team, as the case may be, with an eye towards new innovations that might might further speed up uh, the, the pathway to, towards delivering value. I, I think the I very much see part of the output of my team, part of what we owe to the company, not just to be effective delivery, effective and secure delivery of the things that the business wants to do, but to be the people who are bringing an idea of what's possible as well. We are immersed in the technology and so much of innovation is driven by the evolution of technology and its increasing accessibility. I tend to think about technology as sort of a spectrum from on the one hand, there's really hard stuff. And on the other hand, there's trivially easy stuff. And we're not in the game of doing really hard stuff. That's not the organization that we're built for. But hard things get easier over time. And there's this constant shift from more complicated and less accessible but powerful technology into things that are increasingly easy to get our hands on. And at some point, there's this tipping point where the hard becomes easy. And if we can be there at the point where things become easy and we understand how to put them into action in a real business against our real processes and our real problems, that's the area where I think we can create the most value. But that requires you to be always sort of playing around at the edge of that transition point and make sure you recognize when that transition has happened and it's time to start going after the value. That's part of our role within the organization as a whole. It's to make sure we understand where that transition is starting to happen. We're advising the business on what opportunities that opens up um, to go and drive more value in a very different way. And we're helping them get there and navigate that stage of things. Very interesting. And I know that uh, one of the areas in which you you and the team have put considerable thought is into the uses of, of artificial intelligence, generally speaking, and generative artificial intelligence more specifically. And um, talk a bit about Len AI, if you would, its invention, as well as its uses that you are seeing. Provide a bit of a description, if you would. So Len AI is our um, internal chat GPT clone, in effect. Obviously, the yeah, hugely hypey topic, um, enormous amounts of attention paid to this. I've just been at a conference earlier this week where this was the topic in every single presentation, I think. But it was pretty clear at the beginning of the year this was going to be a fairly big deal. It was a technology that had a particularly short path to value. So the concept I was just talking about of things that were hard suddenly making this transition um, into being very accessible and very applicable to real world problems that we have, that was clearly happening with generative AI. The question was, how could we get our hands on it? And how could we get our hands on it in a secure fashion? So we started working at the beginning of the year on a few different options. One was partnering with vendors. That didn't pan out. It turned out to be really quite eye-wateringly expensive. And then the other was to set up our own secure path into some of these models. And essentially, when um, Microsoft uh, made the OpenAI backends available in a secure fashion with a little bit of extra engineering, we could make that available to our own teams. And so we did that. Uh, we started off by getting people experimenting with API access alone. I guess th th this was in inherently uh, a massively democratized technology anyway. Uh, the take up of people generally uh, of the usage of, of tools like ChatGPT was extraordinary. We wanted to try and mirror that internally. We knew people had this hunger. So I wanted to provide an outlet for that. And I wanted to be able to give people some of the same kind of capability. I didn't think we needed to spend a lot of time worrying about precisely what the use cases were. It felt like the use cases would be emergent. So very quickly after we had access to the APIs in a secure fashion, we created um, the chat interface on top of that, which is what we call NAI, actually took us uh, about a day and a half to put the first version up to a pilot group of people. That was really the push for the summit of a lot of work we've done over the last number of years on things like Velocity to put us in a position where we could do things like that quickly. But uh, we rolled it out to, um, to a few hundred people as we tested it out and we pushed it into production for the entire firm um, about 28 days later. 
And uh, we're pretty happy with the speed of that. I still like it to be able to go a bit faster. Um, but now we've had over 20,000 people use it. We're seeing tens of thousands of, of requests coming in a day. And everyone is doing different things. It's, I think we've identified something of the order of 300 distinct use cases that people have been putting this to. Some are very specifically related to some small part of the business. Others are more generic. But we've been keeping an eye on that, capturing that information. And we're using that to then drive our build-out agenda um, for some of the things that are going to be more scalable implementations of this. Are, are there aspects of the conclusions you're drawing there that you'd be willing to share, Paul, in terms of where you see this beginning to head or where, where further value might be derived? Yeah, I think there are a few observations I would make about it. It's interesting to see how this is going to show up in terms of value. So uh, a few thoughts. One, if I listen to a lot of what I've heard from peers and around the industry, while I don't think we're unique, a lot of people seem to have started with a very classic, let's gather use cases first approach, find use cases, find a business co-sponsor, build a business case, um, try and assemble a project team, get started. That's a, a slow, narrow band process. And it requires working through a lot of organizational roadblocks that have been put up to stop exactly this sort of thing um, from happening. And um, by going the other way and driving something more generic out and flushing the use cases out, I think we've got further faster. What are we seeing? Uh, so we added a couple of extra capabilities into the basics, internet search, document upload. Uh, we do a lot of work with documents. So there's lots of stuff people are doing with document summarization, with um, data extraction from documents, translation uh, between languages, which these tools are actually very good at, email drafting, particularly people for whom English is not the first language when we're a business that largely operates in English. A lot of people are using it just to tighten up their communications and, and streamline things. Certainly in my team, lots of people are writing code with it. I think it's a nice little snippet that parts of LenAI were written by LenAI as we built out the capabilities later. And we're now at the stage where we're starting to introduce more tools for Len AI to use, including calculators, stock price lookups, weather lookups, the ability to query databases, the ability to pull news sources and things like that, that start to get more into you know, heavyweight work that we do around the organization all the time. The problem with a lot of this stuff is that it mostly falls into the category of generally helpful background productivity improvement. And I think one of the problems from a business case perspective is it's very hard to figure out how you monetize that, or even if you want to, maybe you just let the productivity gains flow back into better output and uh, you know better delivery for clients or better work-life balance. There are, however, clearly some use cases where you can see transformation of various processes that we would run through today and would be fairly manual. Um, where we can um, really divert resources into much more high value added work. And those are starting to spin out. And so a lot of it's around things like document ingestion and processing and data extraction, cross mapping data from one data source to another, one data structure to another, turns out to be a, a pretty um, tractable problem as well. And I, I think we're just scratching the surface as to what those sorts of things will be. Really interesting overview of that and interesting also to hear about the broader implications internally, but also potentially externally as well. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, Paul, you, you this really interesting point, parts of Lenai were written by Lenai, that the writing code itself is going to change, has changed, um, and, and it sounds like made things more efficient. Do you have a thought process yet as to how you feel like this will change IT organizations like your own in terms of skills where humans ought to be leaning towards and perhaps away from based upon some of what you're learning here? Or is it too early to uh, to decipher? I think it's mostly too early. I think it's pretty clear that most people, at least some of the time, can benefit from using these tools in terms of their overall productivity. I think it's true that software engineering is one of the places where that's particularly true. What I think we're seeing at the moment is that the more down in the detail you are, the more you're operating at the level of you know, a function or of a module or of a test, the better the tools are and the better suited they are to the work that's being done. But like a lot of things, it's taking away a certain type of work and it's putting more of a premium on other types of work. And so I think a lot of the stuff that's about solution architecture at an overall level remains something that is 
a higher level skill that this stuff is not going to intrude on for a little while. So like most things, it'll change the nature of how work's done from the bottom up. I, I mentioned in introducing you that uh, you were the global head of Oliver Wyman Labs, uh, the global co-head of Oliver Wyman's digital practice. You were a, a consultant within Oliver Wyman, as you mentioned, since graduating from university. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the advantages of your pathway to becoming chief information officer, which you would certainly know by now is very unusual. Uh, many, many CIOs were once consultants. Rare is it uh, that they were consultants almost up to the point where they became CIO. You did have a, a brief period of being a deputy uh, uh, alongside your your predecessor, but but in essence, your entire career as a consultant, a leader uh, of, of a consequential practice. Talk a bit about your own reflections of the advantage of doing your job now based on your experience getting there. Yeah, I still find myself quite surprised <laughs> to, to be where I am. And uh, it all happened because I walked into the wrong meeting one day and got sucked into the project to design Marsh McLennan's um, technology strategy um, with uh, Scott Gilbert, who was my predecessor, and then sucked into trying to deliver it, which anyone who's been a consultant should know you should never do. You should never both write the strategy and take responsibility for delivering it. It's certainly been very helpful in a number of indirect ways. I've been in executive committee rooms and boardrooms since my 20s. And so it makes operating in, in that sort of area very comfortable. Um, which I think uh, isn't always true if you've gone through the ranks. I think I bring a, a, a different perspective coming from having seen how lots of different companies approach problems and get a sense as to what's common and what's different between them. I think there are characteristics of the way this job is set up and the way that I've designed my own role that are well suited for my background. And there are other types of roles within the organization I think I would do less well. I think there's a good match between the type of transformation agenda we're going through, which is heavily focused on get the right organization, build the right culture, drive velocity, drive simplification, find sort of structural underlying levers that we can pull that level everything up, which I'm well suited for. There's a lot of stuff that we do within the organization where I think I'm glad that I have the leaders I have in those roles because I think they're doing those jobs much better than I ever could. So I think it's it's sort of swings and roundabouts, probably, in terms of what skills it, it brings. Well, one of the other things that occurs to me, at least, uh, Paul, is you had profit and loss responsibilities until very recently. And a lot of your peers, uh, many of them never did on their pathway to becoming peers of yours. Uh, and, and I wonder to what extent... I realize you've not been a CIO. There's no, there's no there's another one of you that you can compare yourself to. But uh, I wonder if your orientation towards both sides of the profit equation and a direct cognizance of the drivers of revenue in a business like yours has given you a different orientation as CIO to think about both making sure that you're running an efficient organization and fostering the sorts of uh, processes and mechanisms and innovations that will help keep the company generally uh, efficient while also being cognizant of the use of technology that will drive revenue growth. Yeah, I think there's probably something in that. I mean, I was uh, um, not just running a practice, I was a revenue driving client facing partner for um, the vast majority of that time. And that probably does influence a number of things. I, in particular, when it comes to designing the right organization structure, I have a strong empathy for the feeling the business might have of feeling disconnected from influence over technology strategy. And that probably comes from being on that side of the fence for so long. I think the other thing, which is more a characteristic of Oliver Wyman's culture, Oliver Wyman for a long time had a value uh, that it called anti-kudzu. Um, kudzu, for those who don't know, is a sort of uh, creeping vine that I think originally came over from Japan, but strangles trees and telegraph poles in the south of, southeast of the US in particular. And it was a metaphor for that sort of constant, ever-growing, creeping bureaucracy that climbs over and strangles organizations. And um, it was very much a part of the Oliver Wyman culture to fight against that at every turn and to be very wary of it. And I actually think that's probably had a fairly strong influence on me. Um, because big corporate functional organizations do have a tendency to lean into that direction. And there is a bit of a tendency in any organization, I think, to try and accumulate power and influence. And one of the ways that's done is through um, adding more process. 
And um, a lot of what we've had to do actually is, is to wind back some of that stuff and find a smarter way together. Yeah, it's a, a great description. I appreciate you sharing that. I wanted to ask you also, Paul, we've, we've already spoken about some, some trends uh, of consequence, generative AI being a very, very prominent one uh, among your peer group and, and in the world more generally speaking at present. I wonder, as you look to the future, are there other trends uh, that particularly excite you and are, are making their way on your, onto your uh, roadmap that you, you might call out? Yeah, it's something I was, um, I've been having a few conversations about over the last week, because one of the things that was interesting about the conference I was just at was obviously Gen AI was all the hype, but the question was, was anyone talking about it a year ago at the same conference? We know it's a big deal now, but could we see it coming? And therefore, what can't we see coming for next year and the year after that and the year after that? So there are obviously the sort of the ever present um, things out there like quantum computing and so on and so forth. I just don't see those being relevant for us, at least for a long period of time. But there's an area that I've been intrigued by for a while. A couple of areas, actually, they're going to get a bit nerdy, though. A couple of areas that I've been intrigued by for a while, but haven't had the time to dig into properly. One is the extraction of the best ideas of blockchain away from the implementation of blockchain. The concept of sort of formal contract and policy language that is computer processable, that can be used as a way to sort of formally define processes, approvals, sign-offs, etc. A lot of the processes that we operate with is something that was part of the smart contract language of the blockchain. But the blockchain implementation, I think, is too heavy for a lot of different things. And we're fortunate to be in a position where um, we occupy a position of trust in the value chains that we play in. We don't need trustless systems. We, we, we establish trust through the quality of our people and the, um, the legacy of a 150-year-old company. But some of those smart contracts, sort of auto-execution ideas, I think are quite interesting. And I'm trying to get my head around how do you bring that away from that particular technology and still find the kernel of the idea that's more applicable for us? That's one. And the other is more of a... It's something that's been on my mind for a while, which is there are some really interesting libraries for modeling probability distributions explicitly. And we tend to make most business decisions based on sort of central point estimates of what we think is going to happen. And of course, all of these things have uncertainty. And modeling the uncertainty and the risk around things, um, the things that we decide to do is always a second or third order consideration. I'm quite intrigued by the idea of how you can actually bring that uncertainty in right from the beginning and do the calculations on the probability distributions themselves rather than on central point estimates and then estimate errors afterwards. Because I think you could change the way decision-making works quite substantially, but it's a sort of half-formed idea that I haven't quite ever had time to get completely stuck into. Well, I, I think these are these are ideas emblematic, uh, having gotten to know you, Paul, the way that which, in which your mind works, uh, always trying to think about the the next wave, the new idea that others aren't thinking about, ways in which you can redefine old ways of doing things uh, to to derive new new kinds of value. I appreciate you sharing each of those. And actually, uh, that 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 mental orientation is a, a portion of the the response to the question I'm about to pose to you, no doubt. But I wanted to ask you, um, you know, as you reflect on your career, having been a leader now in different parts, uh, both in a significant operating company within Marshall McLennan, now being a, a, a global chief as chief information officer for the entire company. Are there any, have there been some difference makers along the way that you would particularly call out as uh, a key to your rise, uh, ultimately to multiple leadership positions that you've taken on? I could probably divide it into a few different pieces. The first is I was um, very lucky to stumble into consulting out of university. I actually um, started as a summer job with one of the constituent parts of Oliver Wyman. And uh, I only did that because I got bored of um, having spent two years doing summer jobs in a chemical lab. When I came back the second year, we were still trying to make the same chemical that smelled of strawberries as the year before. I decided this probably wasn't going to be fast moving enough and applied to a bunch of companies that I found in the career service and was lucky enough to get a job offer for a company that's still part of Marsh McLennan. But the great thing about consulting is that it has this sort of career ladder that it will drag you along. Um, as long as you can handle the pace. 
And so you don't have to think very hard about career advancement. It's just a question of keeping up and the system will sort of sweep you through. And it gives you access to a, a whole load of opportunities earlier than you would otherwise get them. It's one of the reasons I was nervous about making the leap over into a completely different job, because I didn't know what it was going to be like to manage a team of thousands, uh, what it was going to be like to actually myself bring a load of organizations together. I'd help clients do things like this before, um, but it's very different to managing a few hundred consulting partners or just you know a dozen people on a consulting team. I, I got some advice a very long time ago um, in the early part of my consulting career um, which is to look for opportunities where they're two thirds in a zone you feel you you've, you're very competent in, and one third pushing you outside of your um, comfort area, because that's a place where you have lots of opportunity for personal growth, but you're not that likely to mess it up too badly. Um, and I think you know this job ended up being like that. But there are also some other characteristics. I I tend to um, like to dive deep into things and really make sure I understand them. Um, I still code um, weekly at least. And um, I find that it's much easier to think about how we can make life easier for the developers, how we can make project delivery faster and smoother when it's something I'm actually a customer of myself. Not only that, it also I think helps the organization when they know that I'm a customer um, to see that as an important thing that you know, we want to do really well um, because it's not behind the scenes of the behind the scenes work. It's, you know, it's front and center and drives a huge amount of recognition as well. So I think that's been a, been a helpful skill for me uh, as well. I, I like to, um, I, you sort of noted it, I like to challenge how things are done, regardless of how long the conventional wisdom has stood. I'm often wrong, um, but sometimes I'm right. And I'm okay with that. Um, and uh, I look to my team to keep me on the straight and narrow, which they, uh, which they mostly do. And I very much appreciate it. I, 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 so many fascinating aspects of what you said. One, I, one I'd love to just double click on for a moment, if you don't mind, is that you continue to code. Uh, may I ask the sorts of things? I'm sure it's in a variety of different directions and perhaps in some cases also uh, for personal use of one sort or another. But uh, if there's a way to typify what draws you in and when, I, I'd, I'd be interested to understand further about uh, how you incorporate that into your, your routine. I tend to do it for something that I have a half-formed concept of but I want to make sure I really understand properly. And you know, what's driven a lot of that recently has been generative AI. So I got stuck into that very directly a, a lot over the last few months. And actually it's been a, a round of a few phases of that. It was the early stuff to understand what these models can do by doing stuff with them. Um, it was how you could make them into a more useful tool by playing around with the idea, for instance, of vector databases, storing context that can be brought to a request. More recently, it's how you build tool frameworks that, that are extensible, because these end up being important sort of transition points in the value that's available, where it's hard to tell sometimes which ones are really going to be important and which ones are going to be easy. And I, I've always found that one of the paradoxes in technology is what sounds easy and what sounds hard doesn't necessarily match to what is easy and what is hard. And getting in and really getting a good feel for it myself, even in a very rough and ready way, um, really helps me stay attuned to that. So when new things come along, I tend to play around with them. I tend to try and find some toy implementation, get my head around it. But it also then helps me with the rest of the organization. Um, to be able to go and say, this I think we need to spend time on. And here's why I think we need to spend time on it. You know, this is what I've learned about it. And I'm able to go into those conversations with a level of depth that I, th I think is very valuable in getting an organizational focus turn to these sorts of things. Another great, great description. Thank you so much for sharing that, Paul. And and, and more generally, Paul, I, I want to thank you for... Uh... Uh, very insightful conversation, description of, of many of the new things you're doing, the, the change that you have led uh, in, in your nearly three years in role, and, um, and really appreciate the thoughtful manner in which you've reflected uh, uh, and offered insights across the, the various topics that we've covered. Thank you so much. That's my great pleasure.